to this presentation on the book of Revelation. Here we will be looking at chapter 2 and verses 1 through to 7. These verses describe a letter to the first of seven churches, the church in Ephesus. We'll read through these uh, verses uh, fairly quickly uh, just to get the overall perspective. The reading will be from one of the modern Bible translations, but when we look at the individual uh, uh, verses in more detail, we'll uh, show the uh, King James translation. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. To the angel of a church in Ephesus write, He who holds the seven stars in his right hand, he who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says these things. I know your works and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate those who are evil, and have tested those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and found them false. You have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake, and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I am coming to you and will move your lampstand out of its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat of a tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So here we see in this letter uh, some uh, commendations for this church in Ephesus, that they were laboring, they were working for the Lord, they were toiling hard, they were testing those who were false, prof- false apostles, they hated those that, that were evil, and they were patient and they continued in what they were doing. And uh, But despite all these good points, the Lord has uh, a serious thing against them. He says uh, that they've left their first love and that Unless they repent, the Lord's going to remove their lampstand out of its place. Now, since the lampstand represents the church itself, this is a very serious threat to remove them as uh, being a church before the Lord. We mentioned the seven churches and when looking at uh, Revelation chapter 1, and we looked at an introduction to these, These seven letters to seven churches uh, could also be viewed as seven letters to seven church ages because each of these uh, churches uh, seem to represent seven stages in in Christian history over the last 2,000 years. It fits very, very well how each of these individual stages and the description uh, as it's depicted in these epistles and what's actually been happening over the last 2,000 years And this really gives us a good uh, overview of what's really been happening in the last 2,000 years in the Christian world. Because there are many people who call themselves Christian, and we know that there are many false doctrines, false teachers, lots of people are writing various things, and who are the famous people uh, writing these things? Often we don't know how reliable what they say is, but here when we look at... uh, Revelation, and we look at the overview, we could uh, get a very good perspective on what's really been happening in the uh, in the world, in the Christian world over the last 2,000 years. And so we won't be deceived by people who uh, come to us with various odd doctrines about apostolic succession, and so they say their church is, uh, is just a continuation from uh, the early church or, or various other doctrines that people have because we can hold them up against what we see and what we know in uh, in the light of Bible prophecy. Incidentally, these uh, seven letters to seven churches were letters to seven uh, churches in seven cities that were scattered throughout Asia Minor, or what's uh, now modern-day Turkey. The first of of these is uh, the letter to the church in Ephesus, and this represents the early Christian church, the very uh, beginning of a church, which started on the day of Pentecost when uh, they all received the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, and about 3,000 were added to the church. And from there they really grew and expanded, and they really labored hard and uh, and uh, really spread 
the gospel throughout uh, the then known world. But as we know, the, the church is no longer around. What we see around us when we look at the churches is something very different. And so we can say with uh, uh, with some certainty that they did lose their first love. They lost their way. We can't say exactly what date this happened. It's not like, well, one day, month, year, everything was fine. The next uh, day, things were horribly wrong. It's not like that at all. It probably just gradually faded out. Uh, but we can say that somewhere in the uh, first century after Christ, uh, maybe around 150 AD, the early Christian church was, was uh, really starting to go. And the main characteristic, of course, they lost their first love. Many Bible commentators say the, the name Ephesus means to let go. Uh, it's not clear if uh, that really is the meaning or not. Other people say the meaning is desirable, uh, based on similarity to a Greek word meaning desirable. And other people say the word Ephesus comes from a Hittite word because originally there was, this was a Hittite city. Uh, the meaning of that was latter place uh, in the sense of the back of beyond. But uh, whatever the actual name means, whether it's to let go or not, uh, the phrase to let go is certainly an apt description of uh, of this church. Uh, as we mentioned on the previous slide, this starts with the beginning of a church around 30 AD, and we can't fix the end date. But obviously it must continue beyond when the book of Revelation was actually given, because otherwise there wouldn't have been any point writing about it if it had already disappeared by this time. Now this uh, particular time uh, was very uh, turbulent. There were lots of things happening in the uh, in the world in general. We had uh, quite severe persecutions by Emperor Nero uh, around 60 AD and his grand designs of rebuilding Rome after after being burnt down. He needed culprits, of course, so uh, that was part of a reason why Christians were persecuted. Also, we see in that in this era the temple in Jerusalem being destroyed, and that must have had quite a dramatic effect on the whole world at that time. Certainly, the the Jewish world and the Christian world, but that wasn't the only uh, event that happened uh, in the terms of persecution. And and uh, around 30 A.D., Emperor Hadrian expelled all the Jews from uh, from Jerusalem and renamed the whole province to Palestine. Uh, he called it Palestine because that was the Roman equivalent of uh, Philistine, so he was doing that despite the Jews, which gives some indication of, of just the bitterness that there was between the, the Jews and the Romans. During this time, the pagan Roman Empire is really growing strong in power, and Christianity is spreading rapidly throughout that. Just a word about the ancient city itself. It's very large and prosperous, pr perhaps a city of 200,000 people, uh, one of the largest cities in the region. It was famous for one of the uh, seven wonders of the ancient world that was located in the city, the Temple of Artemis or, or the Temple of Diana. Uh, the actual word in the Greek is Artemis, but uh, uh, King James translators always translated the Greek uh, gods with the with their Latin equivalents, so instead of Artemis, they put Diana. However, the character and nature of this, of this goddess is quite clear. It was the great mother goddess, also known as Ashtoreth and Ishtar. And the city itself uh, declined when its harbour silted up. It also suffered uh, quite a few other catastrophes when the Goths invaded uh, in the 200s AD. The city of Ephesus is also mentioned in Acts chapter 19 when Paul and his disciples were there. It talks there in Acts 19 verse 29 and the whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. And the theatre that they're talking about is probably 
uh, the one that's uh, depicted in this image on, this, on the screen here, uh, the ruins of which we see, it probably holds around 25,000. And these, if this was full, it would have been quite a scary thought for the disciples who were, who were being surrounded by these worshippers of Diana or Artemis, shouting, Great is Diana of, of the Ephesians. Stirred on, of course, by the uh, silversmiths who uh, saw the uh, revenue uh, potentially disappearing. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. And in these things we see uh, Jesus emphasizing his authority over the church and his presence right in their midst. Many of the false teachings uh, that were around tried to change the emphasis, maybe move the emphasis away from Jesus and towards other things or other beings. Uh, perhaps we might also include into that those that tried to uh, switch the emphasis more towards uh, Mary, uh, who was the... Uh, uh, the successor to that great mother goddess, Diana or Artemis. And in verse 2, I know thy works and thy labour and thy patience and how thou cannot, not, can not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. So here it's really mentioning some excellent points that this church has, that they're really working, they're really laboring, and they're being patient, and they can't bear people who are evil, and and they've checked out all the false apostles. And these are great commendations, great things to, uh, to be able to say about the church. We do know from, uh, from history that there were many false prophets and, and false apostles, we even know in the book of Acts, uh, uh, chapter 20, it talks there when Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders before going off on his journey, his last words to them, he was telling them or warning them about grievous wolves which would uh, uh, come into the church not sparing the flock. So false prophets and false teachers were always around. We know of uh, one particular sect that appeared uh, I don't know how important these really were, but these were the, the Gnostics, uh, people who thought they had their own secret knowledge or, or divine knowledge that they had. One of the main aspects of, of their teachings was they denied the authenticity in the Gospels relating to the birth of Christ. They couldn't grasp the humanity of Christ and they couldn't uh, uh, comprehend his physical appearance on the earth. They... Uh, they they understood uh, Jesus Christ as being the Son of God and being of a divine nature. They they wondered how can the the divine can be reconciled to the flesh? How can uh, God appear in human form? Because they recognized just how evil the flesh was and how corrupt it was, even from the point of view of how it decays and eventually gets sick and and dies. Whereas uh, the uh, God, of course, is eternal. So they couldn't comprehend this thing of uh, Christ being both a man and a God, the Son of Man and the Son of God. Uh, they wrote uh, quite a few works, some of these uh, getting a little bit of a revival, if we can use that term, the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Thomas. Interesting that they picked uh, two d disciples there, one that betrayed the Lord and one uh, famous for uh, doubting the Lord. In 1 John chapter 4, we're told, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Don't believe everything you see and hear. Check it out, be careful. Test, hold it up to the light of the scriptures. It continues, Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. 
and this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world in the first century AD, so don't wait for some uh, Antichrist to appear 2,000 years later. Uh, that's one of the uh, fanciful stories that people come up with. Uh, some more of the false prophets, the ones that continue and they never stop. You do really need to pause and reflect for a moment. Uh, why do we have false prophets? And the reason uh, that question is posed is because people don't wake up in the morning and think, I've got an idea, I'm going to become a false prophet. They obviously think that they're, that they're right, they think that they're doing something that's correct, and so they're, they're deceived, and they've deceived themselves, and then they go out and deceive others. So it's uh, uh, quite a thing to meditate on, is why do you have people who become false prophets? Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1 also warns, but the, there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. In verse 3, continuing here, it says, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. And that certainly is the case for the early Christian church. They spread all the way from uh, from Jerusalem, all the way through through Galilee, through all the Middle East, uh, into Europe, across North Africa, basically everywhere where the Roman Empire had been, they went. And this this is the result of patience and the result of labouring. So if ever you think that your labour is in vain in the Lord, this is uh, something to uh, bear in mind. The end result of many people labouring and continuing on in, in the things of God and uh, persisting. Matthew 28, we're told, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. In, for, in verse 4 we get to the nevertheless. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. And many people have written about these things and spoken about these things and, and referred to the church's first love as being their, their love for Christ, their fervency, uh, comparing the fervency of new believers and their zeal and uh, with, the, with that first love. Um, it does appear to be uh, uh, part of a picture, but there may well be more to this. Uh, there may be an aspect in which this first love is also referring to the basic priorities of a church. These are the things that started to diminish instead of continuing to grow. And just one example of that is the baptism of infants, not in the scriptures, no, not in the uh, early Christian church, but the start, there is some indication that it might have, might have started to appear around the 2nd or 3rd century AD. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. So what's it mean when it says, do the first works? Now if you remember uh, Acts chapter 19, when Paul came across some disciples in, in Ephesus, his question for them was, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they hadn't received the Holy Spirit, they hadn't heard of the Holy Spirit, so uh, uh, when Paul had laid hands on them, they, uh, they all received the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is the first thing that the Ephesian church ever did, and perhaps this is the first works that's being referred to here, 
that the, the very basics, the first things that you ever do, the repentance, being baptized, receiving the Holy, Holy Ghost, these are the very first things. And perhaps these are the things that were starting to fade, fade away and uh, the basics of salvation. And so if a candlestick is being removed because they're no longer a church, that would certainly be a c the case if we're no longer telling people about receiving the Holy Spirit. Then there would no longer be a church anymore. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of Aniclatanes, which I also hate. Various ideas have been put forth about who or what the Aniclatanes might be. And the fact that uh, various ideas have been put forth really gives you some uh, uh, thought that perhaps it's not, not crystal clear. Um, and that uh, it should be noted that the word doesn't actually appear before the book of Revelation elsewhere in the Bible. So if we are to understand this, we have to understand it in terms of, of what we know. Uh, some people have suggested that it might have been followers of Nicholas, a, a Gnostic teacher, but that could be a fairly literal interpretation, too literal when we're looking for a book of signs and symbols. Plus Gnostics, if they are even important at all, have already been covered as false prophets. Uh, another suggestion is that this relates to the meaning of a Greek word. The Greek word itself comes from uh, two words, or it seems like it's a, uh, a combining of two words, one niko meaning to overcome, and another word which means the common people or laity. And so then this would mean overcome the, the people. Uh, so it would seem to represent people that, that lord it over the uh, common folk. That was something that was non-existent in the early church, with elders and church leaders, truly servants, to feed and minister to the flock. And you see that throughout uh, the epistles where the Apostle Paul is talking and uh, or writing to, uh, uh, to the various churches there. We see that he wasn't acting like somebody who expected to be housed in a great mansion, uh, to have a Learjet to uh, transport him from one city to another, but he labored, he was a tent maker by profession, and so uh, it's not like somebody who is amassing vast wealth, uh, not someone who is lording it over the flock. In later church ages, in contrast, we do see a division between the clergy and the laity, and the, crow, and the priesthood started to really grow and take off, and eventually uh, this led to uh, the, uh, what, what could be described as a papacy and, uh, and the, uh, the Catholic Church and its full power with absolute domin domination over, over king, even the kings and the, let alone all the common people. So this was the progression from, uh, from the early church to later on. Just a m minor comment, but some people uh, uh, move the uh, mean, change the meaning of this of this word uh, overcome the people to overcome by the people, but that's not really what it means, and it doesn't fit in with what we see in history. So in the, in the Ephesian church, the early Christian church, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, but the church in Pergamos. They held the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the church in Pergamos. We will look at this in more detail in later on, but basically it's a church that starts from around 300 AD at a time when the church is starting to compromise and continues on through until the uh, uh, Dark Ages. A little, a little bit about uh, uh, this uh, later age, we will cover this a little bit more in more detail, of course, when we look to the letter in the Church of Ephesus. But one of the uh, uh, principal events in this age was uh, a church council convened in 325 AD by Emperor Constantine to resolve a number of issues. Calling it a church council actually gives it an air of respectability that it doesn't really de uh, deserve when you read some of the uh, uh, 
uh, facts and how it proceeded, what happened at around that time. Also, it's uh, uh, it's fascinating to see that this was convened by Emperor Constantine, which again must make you think. Emperor Constantine was a secular ruler. He wasn't a church leader. And yet, this church council was uh, being convened by him. It's like a church council being convened by a prime minister or a... Uh, or a president, uh, like a uh, like a prime minister convening a, a council of pastors. That's uh, what it's like. And this council uh, uh, resolved many issues. Uh, it uh, gives us a, a little bit of a peek into what things were really like there, but to a degree we have to read behind uh, between the lines to see what was actually behind what these things were about. They affirmed the divinity of Christ, a good thing of course. They came up with something called the Nicene Creed. Very famous now today of course. The Nicene Creed on the surface doesn't appear that bad. The things that are said in that but and we get something called Nicene Christianity developing out of it. Uh, they also fixed the date of Easter. Here again, you have to stop and think: Why were they fixing the date of Easter? Isn't just isn't this just the date of a Jewish Passover? But instead, they fixed their own date, dependent on an actual uh, on the position of a moon, and this can vary between uh, March and April, all over the place every year. And they had uh, rules about the uh, baptism. Uh, about the uh, validity of baptism by heretics and the promulgation of canon law rules within the church. And when you look at some of these rules, you start to uh, get a, an idea that things are really changing from the early Christian church, even though there's nothing glaring, blatantly, uh, glaringly obvious saying this is dreadful. They're just little things that here that make you pause and think, there was the establishment of a minimum term for persons studying for baptism. And that's not scriptural, of course. In the book of Acts, when the Ethiopian eunuch saw water, he said, what uh, prevents me from being baptized right now? And the answer was nothing. And he was baptized immediately. No term of studying. Uh, Another point is there was a precedence of bishops and presbyters before deacons in receiving the communion. So we start to see this hierarchy starting to be developed even within the clergy that, that some people were considered more important than others and so they received their communion first. Some odd things are prohibit prohibit prohibiting of kneeling on Sundays and during Pentecost because they felt that uh, the right way to pray was standing up was the prohibition of removal of priests. So once you're a priest, you're a priest for life. There was prohibition of usury among the clergy. Now you wouldn't uh, ban something unless it was happening. And usury is uh, uh, paying for clerical offices. And you obviously you wouldn't pay money for these offices unless there was some actual benefit to these things. And then again, there was that declaration about the uh, invalid, uh, how invalid the baptism was by, by uh, heretics. He who ha he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of a tree of life, which is in the midst of a paradise of God. So the. The epistle ends with an admonition to the church to listen and heed the warnings of these letters to the churches. These things are important. It's important and there is a need to overcome and there's a great reward to those that overcome. And that concludes this presentation. Thank you for listening.